I wanted to uh, welcome everybody and thank you again for taking the time to join us this morning. We're really excited to host this uh, industry or professional panel session uh, around foot and ankle biomechanics. My name's Amy and I'm here to introduce everybody. Uh, I work for Vicon. I'm our business development manager for the region that includes Latin America. Um, hopefully many of you that are attending today already know about the foot and ankle biomechanics conference that's going to be happening in April. Uh, the conference is being uh, chaired by a woman named Isabel Sacco from the University of Sao Paulo. And while it is a bit unfortunate that we won't all be meeting in person in Brazil this year, there is a wonderful online conference planned and coming up. So if any of you are not already registered for the International Foot and Ankle Biomechanics, we would definitely uh, encourage you to check that out and register. And today we have a panel of some of the presenters that you'll be hearing from more formally during the conference. So before we get started, I wanted to give a brief introduction to our host for the day, Dr. Kim Duffy, as well as our three panelists. So really briefly, uh, Dr. Duffy is currently the Life Sciences Product Manager here at Vicon. She joined Vicon in 2007 as a support engineer and in May 2008 assumed the role of Life Sciences Product Manager. Before joining Vicon, Dr. Duffy received her PhD from the University of Essex where her focus included using the Vicon motion capture system to explore the effects of aging on gait and functional movement characteristics in older adult populations. Alongside her role at Vicon, she remains active at the University of Essex as a fellow researcher. Dr. Duffy also holds a first class bachelor's honors degree in sports science with a focus on biomechanics and a master's in biomechanics of gait and posture from Liverpool John Morse University. Building on these years of academic and research innovation, her current focus at Vicon as product manager is on the introduction and growth of Vicon products as they relate to the life sciences field. For example, uh, to fields such as healthcare, biomechanics, and injury. Next, I have the honor of introducing Professor Irene Davis. Dr. Davis is a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School and founding director of the Spalding National Running Center, an integrated clinical and research center. She has remained clinically active for the past 35 years. Her research is uh, focused on the relationship between lower extremity structure, mechanics, and injury. She has a particular interest in foot and knee injuries to include patellofemoral pain syndrome, Achilles tendonitis, uh, and plantar fasciitis, along with bone stress injuries of the lower leg and foot. Her research also extends to the development of interventions to alter faulty mechanics through gait retraining. She's been studying the use of wearable sensors in both the evolution and treatment of injured runners. Her interests also include the effect of minimal footwear on the mechanics and injury. And Dr. Davis has received funding from the Departments of Defense and National Institutes of Health to support her research. She's given over 350 lectures, both nationally and internationally, and authored 160 publications on the topic of lower extremity mechanics and injury. Next, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor uh, Madhu Venkadesan, who is the Associate Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Sciences at Yale University. Dr. Madhu studies the mechanics and control of how animals move. Problems being pursued include locomotion in animals, the geometry of joints, the topology of shape-changing skins, and the dynamics of muscles. Uh, the motivation for the application of this work includes bio, biomedical sciences, evolutionary biology, robotics, and plain curiosity about everyday observations. He's the recipient of many professional awards, including, including the Human Frontier Science Program's Young Investigator Award, the Society for Neural Control of Movement Scholarship, and more recently, the NSF Career Award, which was from this year in 2021. Congratulations, Professor. And okay. finally, last but not least, I'd like to uh, introduce Professor William Lido. Uh, currently, he holds positions as a research career scientist at the VA Center for Limb Loss and Mobility, also known as the CLIMB Lab in Seattle, Washington. He's also an affiliate professor in the Departments of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. His research has been devoted to preventing limb loss, either functionally or anatomically. He uses CT, MRI, motion analysis, and more recently, a custom-developed biplane bi fluoroscope to quantify reduced lower limb function, also known as functional limb loss in different types of foot, such as flat feet or high arched compared to neutrally aligned feet. He studied the functional aspects of various orthopedic foot maladies using the custom developed robot gait simulator, 
Additionally, he has explored functional differences between ankle fusion and ankle joint replacement for end-stage ankle arthritis. Anatomical limb loss prevention has involved quantifying the mechanical, histological, and biochemical differences between normal and diabetic plantar soft tissue and foot ligaments. And he has also developed a patient-specific finite element foot model, including customized anatomy and tissue properties for the purpose of quantifying the effects of increased tissue stiffness and foot deformity on inertial tissue stiffness. Finally, he has explored the complex relationship between foot type and diabetic ulceration. So hopefully I've done those introductions uh, some justice and everybody uh, uh, has some familiarity around some of the types of topics that our panelists uh, have some background in. We are encouraging all of our attendees to the webinar today to ask questions throughout the session. The question and answer section uh, of Zoom is open, so please put questions in there anytime you think of them. We'll be monitoring them throughout, and we'll be picking uh, selected questions at the end to ask the panelists. Um, we'll also be putting up a couple of polls throughout the day um, where we'll ask uh, the attendees to give us some feedback that might guide some of the conversation. And for more information about uh, webinars that we're putting on for topics related to life sciences and other areas of motion capture, you can follow all of the Vicon social media channels. So I am going to get out of the way and let our host and moderator, Kim Duffy, get things started with a great conversation. And thank you again to all the panelists for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Amy. Uh, so welcome everyone to the first life science biomechanics panel. So as Amy mentioned, we're going to be talking, hopefully get some really good discussions about foot and ankle biomechanics. And as Amy said, we are proudly sponsoring the International Foot and Ankle Biomechanics Congress on the 11th to April, uh, 14th of April. So the first question, um, you are all presenting at this Congress. Can you please uh, provide a little overview of what you'll be presenting at this uh, conference? Irene, would you like to start? Sure. So um, I'm going to be uh, I'm giving a keynote, keynote as well as a pre-conference course, and the keynote is on um, understanding the foot core and changing the way that we think about the foot. I think our feet are really amazing, and I think that we underestimate the ability of our feet to both cushion and control our landings, which we really there evolved to do. And I think if we can change the way that we think about it, it will influence both our, um, the way that we treat the foot, the way that we prevent injuries. Um, and I think that that's something that's really, again, we, we, we think that the foot rather than the externally cushioning and externally controlling the foot, um, I'd like people to start thinking about really directing their, their focus on having the foot do that for itself. I'm definitely going to include um, some evidence about minimal footwear and the use of minimal footwear across the lifespan, its benefits in children, its benefits in adults, its benefits in older adults, and I'm going to highlight some research um, that Belseco, who is the, um, the host of this meeting, um, has done in the area of NEOA. Um, and, and also even in early um, diabetes, pre-peripheral neuropathy. So um, that's sort of an overview, hopefully a little bit of a teaser of this uh, keynote. In terms of my pre-conference course, I'm gonna be talking about retraining uh, mechanics um, with issues that are related to the foot and ankle. So a lot of our work has been um, focused on um, identifying mechanics related to injuries and then and then developing gait retraining um, approaches to alter, to mitigate those mechanics. So we'll be looking at different kinds of foot um, mechanics, uh, toe in, toe out, excessive pronation, those kinds of things, and how we can change them. Um, and, um, uh, and, and I think that that's another, another area that people maybe underappreciate, that we have this very dynamic system that that this motor system that can be changed in terms of gait. I think a lot of people feel that gait is um, something that we can't alter. Um, and there's these central pattern generators. And I'm going to give examples and show examples. I believe that we have hardware and software. So the hardware is really our musculoskeletal system. And I'll talk about how it's important to augment the strength and flexibility of the foot when you make these changes, but that you have to incorporate the hardware, which is the brain and the motor pattern. 
So that's kind of an overview. That's great. Um, I'm already excited for that keynote and the, the pre-Congress course. Madhu, would you like to give an overview of what you're presenting, please? Sure. Um, I'm giving uh, one keynote, uh, uh, one lecture during the, the conference. The conference, what I'm going to talk about is a very physical sciences approach, but blending it with evolutionary biology to really ask how we, how do we have feet the way we do and what does the shape of the foot have to do with its mechanical response? Uh, some of it is using analysis of simple models, toys, uh, I can even weigh one of the toys right here. We think about uh, thin structures and how to change their stiffness by changing subtle changes to their shape. Like I curl the paper a little bit, it becomes stiff. I can use such physical analogies, but we know the foot is far more complicated. It is not just a simple sheet of paper. It's a, it's a living organ with musculature, it can be tuned. So how do we go from thinking about mechanics at, at very fundamental levels to, uh, actually studying real feet and seeing what of these insights carry over there and can we apply this to our understanding of the evolution of the foot itself. So I will mostly talk uh, just about that specific uh, in investigation or set of investigations in my group. That's great. And Bill? Uh, thanks, Kim. So I'm giving uh, no keynotes, but two, uh, two oral sessions. Um, one is related to a study that looks at the effects or the relationship between the intrinsic muscles in your foot and the extrinsic muscles in your foot and the claw toe deformity. There's been a, a theory out there that uh, you get a, a claw toe deformity because your extrinsic muscles are overpulling your intrinsic muscles. And so we did a study where we looked at diabetic patients who had claw toes and neuropathy or didn't have claw toes and didn't have neuropathy and did a, a four by four comparison, two by two comparison and found a strong relationship between uh, the, the subjects that had both claw toes and neuropathy had less intrinsic muscle volume in their feet. Um, and they also had thicker plantar apneuroses. And so from a mechanical standpoint, it really makes sense that these patients would develop uh, claw toes. The, uh, the second study is related to the motion of the sesamoid. So two small bones meet your great toe joint. And uh, the abstract itself is looking at just the open connect chain work, but we've also had some closed connect chain work where we've looked at patients, or sorry, cadavers, in a weight-bearing CT scan and then using a jig that applied body weight um, to, the, um, to the cadaver feet. And we looked at, again, open connect and closed connect chain uh, motion of both uh, the great toe and of the sesamoids relative to the first metatarsal. The sesamoids are about the size of a, a large P, and so they're, they're very hard to, to measure their motion in traditional, well, you can't do in traditional motion analysis, but in biplane fluoroscopy, it's also very hard. And so this is one of the first studies to track the motion of the sesamoids. Um, and it has implications for people who have great toe arthritis and uh, in the future. That's really interesting. I bet that also had some interesting challenges in terms of capturing that data. Um, what are the most interesting current trends in foot and ankle biomechanics? And where do you think this area of research will be headed in the future, for example, in the next five years, 10 years? I'm happy for whoever wants to answer that question first. I'm happy to start. Um, I think that there are two areas in, in my opinion that are really exciting in terms of understanding foot and ankle biomechanics. One of them is um, biplanar video radiography. Uh, because, uh, and we do have a keynote, um, Michael Rainbow is going to be speaking on that topic at the IFAB. Um, it is, you know, it, because there are 26 bones and 33 articulations and they move with six degrees of freedom, it's really hard. And I know we can talk about the models as we try to come up with a way to measure it with, with external kinematics. Um, but really, we need to look at it from um, a, a, the, using this three-dimensional video radiography allows you to look at the six degree of freedom motion of each bone and the joints. And I think that's really exciting. I know it's, it's right now it's extremely laborious to do that kind of work and takes a lot of time, but you know, we're early, we're really early in this technology. So that's, that's one area that I think is really exciting. Um, and then the other area I think is, is, exciting is taking, and I know we, this is another topic we may, may talk, touch upon, but taking our study outside the lab um, and getting people into their natural environments, no matter what it is that we're studying, walking, running, whatever it is, um, people 
in labs, we all recognize that they know they're being watched. You know, your, your doctor has you walk perhaps, and you know, you're coming in, I had a knee problem and I was walking with my best behavior, you know? So I think it's really important when you know you're being observed that, that it may not be what you're really experiencing in the, out, in the, out in the wild, so to speak. So those are two areas I think are really exciting. So I'll, I'll chime in next. My, my first area is the same first area that Irene mentioned, which is biplane fluoroscopy. Um, I'm one of the labs that is developing a biplane fluoroscope specializing in the foot and ankle. Um, and the kind of questions that I think are really unique to what you can answer with these systems are, imagine you have got uh, uh, ankle arthritis and so your ankle is fused. And um, we know that you get much less motion out of that joint because the joint's fused. But if you go to a traditional motion analysis uh, where you've got the calcaneus instrumented and the tibia instrumented, you still get similar ranges of motion. So it's obviously not happening at the ankle, it's happening at the subtalar joint. And you cannot see what the subtalar joint is doing in traditional motion analysis, but you can with these biplane philosophy systems. So I think that's a, a real exciting area of future research is just to identify individual foot, bone, foot joints, um, especially in pathologic feet and see how they're, how they're affected. And the, the second area that I, I thought of when you asked this question was um, weight-bearing CT scans. Um, I work closely with, uh, with a foot and ankle surgeon. Um, and when I first started collaborating with him uh, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, he had a device that um, basically a person sat in a traditional CT scanner and on, a, on like a, a chair and their feet were pushed towards their, their, their knees. And the idea was uh, a flat foot if you just look at it flaccidly, it may not look flat, it may look, uh, look an orange. Once you load it, it collapses. And so he really wanted to have weight-bearing CT scans of, of, his of his clinical patients, but it was not a calibrated frame. They didn't know how much force they were applying. And so we've worked on developing ways of, of loading people's feet uh, to get a clinical CT scan before surgery, uh, but it's always partial weight-bearing. Um, and nowadays with the, the various cone beam CT scanners, we can actually get a person to stand in a CT scanner upright and apply their own body weight to the, to the scan and stand in neutral position. Uh, it's just a, an excellent and exciting tool to have moving forward for, uh, for surgical planning. We'll pitch in next. I, I wholly agree with everything Irene and uh, Bill were telling. The complexity of the foot itself is mind boggling. External markers can only tell you so much. We need to look inside. Uh, I want to add one, two additional layers to it. One is that it is a living organ. There is, there is a muscle activity that tunes what the foot does. But we, we are really at, begin, at the beginning stages of scratching off those layers and trying to get at what, what, what is it tuning. Uh, and if, if once we know what it is tuning in the context of out in the real world, walking outdoor uh, as a field study, people are fantastic at compensating for deficits. So in that sense, the foot is likely to be a pretty robust organ that where you, you're likely to see a lot of compensatory changes internally through muscle contraction. But we don't fully understand what muscle contraction does. And uh, I think that naturally will lead to uh, broader questions of what are co compensatory things and when do we fail to compensate for uh, differences between feet. And th that would obviously have implications for disease and dis disorders of various kinds. Yeah, I just, can I piggyback on to um, what Bill had said? Um, one of the questions I would love to have more information about is the function of the midfoot or the tail and navicular joint. Back, um, gosh, back in the early 90s, Arnie Lundberg put um, three tantalum balls into many bones of the foot of probably some of his PhD students. They're probably still walking, they are still walking yeah. around with them. Yeah, so are you one of them? No. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, in order to be able to, um, to look at these different various structures of the, and, and joints and how they function. And what he, one of the things that really struck with me, and I was really early in my career at the time, was that the tail and navicular joint has twice as much motion as the subtalar joint. So that, that there's a lot of money there in that, that tail and navicular joint. And, and most of the studies that we see in the literature about eversion or pronation is really uh, a function of looking at the calcaneus with respect to the tibia, which is all that we can really put markers on well. And as Bill said, you're really looking at tibio calcaneal motion, which is a combination of tailor curl and subtalar. Um, and again, I think more of the information about maybe malfunction is in the mid, mid tarsal joint or in the tail and navicular joint. I've seen many people who, when I look at them from the back, their rear foot mechanics look fine. But if you look at from the side, they're completely flattened out. And so there's all of that dysfunction in the midfoot. 
And I really think that if we can get at really that kind of information with the biplanar work, um, it's really going to help us to understand basically what the, what the etiology of some of these problems are and how to best treat it. Just to add on to that comment, if that's okay, Kim. Um, Absolutely. You, know, you mentioned the tail and navicular joint, Irene. Well, you know, those are two of the bones that have the highest orthopedic incidences of stress fractures or, or necrosis, tail and navicular necrosis. Um, necrosis, I should say. So there are two areas, two, two bones, the talus and the, and the navicular that are very interested to ortho, very interesting to orthopedic surgeons. Yeah. So how typically I, right now would, um, would you identify those sort of injuries? Is that by scans or I guess, as you said earlier, motion capture is not really the way you're going about that. What, how right now are you able to get that information you need to investigate the midfoot? Well, I, from a, from a clinical standpoint, so I have two hats, I'm a clinician and a scientist. And so from a clinical standpoint, the way that we do it is we video people barefoot um, during gait and we video them from the side view and the back view. And we kind of tease out where is more of this malfunction coming from. Um, so I think that that's one way to do it. Um, and, and I'll let Bill maybe talk more about the multi-segment foot models. I've not used them myself, but there are multi-segment foot models or MADU um, in terms of ways of getting at that kind of dysfunction from a scientific, you know, um, clinic, uh, scientific approach. Yeah, I, I would like to pitch in. Uh, I agree with a lot of things being said, but in the interest of uh, slightly shaking up the conversation, introduce a mild uh, difference of opinion. Um, and I think this is related to one of the questions that uh, has been posted by Evan Dooley uh, on multi-segment foot models. And the question was, can you not get at the internal foot motion without biplanar fluoroscopy if you can track a lot of things over the skin and you know the, what the foot structure is? If I can, the short answer would be no, because there is internal motion. We know there is internal motion, but you can ask a broader uh, version of the question, which is which of these motions are uh, do actually have a functional consequence? Just because you see a lot of motion at some joint does not mean that that is uh, functionally consequential. Uh, if, if I was to think of the foot as a complex mechanism with internal structures, large motion could indicate that's really where a lot of the energy, mechanical energy within the foot is being stored. Or it could mean that that's just the most compliant thing where not much is happening and it's not really bearing much load, which, which it is, is not even a static thing in the foot. And I will again come back to muscles and what muscles do and tune stiffness as a very, very big part of uh, what, what the foot would respond. Uh, so. I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm throwing in a little bit of a difference of opinion that large motions at a joint needs to be interpreted with caution, depending on what, uh, what it could mean for function and functional use of the foot. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll res respond to that. I think, um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you have to couple what you see in mechanics to the injury that somebody has, if you're talking about how it's, um, so you can, I mean, there are people who have, have very flat feet that are fine and do well. And maybe it's because they have that muscular control still, or they have, you know, more muscle activation than someone who's got a flat foot and does not. So I agree with you wholeheartedly that I think you cannot look at it in isolation, um, but it has to be in combination with maybe what you see symptomatically with somebody. Uh, Irene, if I may briefly also respond to, I think there are even questions of how we define flat foot today. We, we look at the medial longitudinal arch and that was the, something that surprised us that we, the, the, there are other curvatures and arches in the foot which uh, can have quite a substantial impact on the foot's mechanical response. And uh, so even, even fundamental definitions and the assumptions underlying those definitions, they, they, I, I will be careful to say that they, they have value. There is enough literature and evidence to show that those have value, but they're not the complete story like you correctly said. There are people who are apparently flat-footed, but they don't show any of the other issues of flat, flat foot. That's great. I think this kind of moves transitions quite nicely into my next question about the type of technology that you use, not only in the lab, but as Irene said, the best type of capture is actually getting them in the environment, so in the field. So what uh, type of 
technology are you using in the lab and field? Do you have any best practices for um, recommendations for other labs uh, using this technology to study the foot and ankle? And is there any limitations to the current technology that is available to capture the data you desire? There's a lot of questions there. Um, yes, <laughs> I think we the can first break it down. Which is maybe we can start with what technology we're all using. And so uh, we've got a traditional motion analysis laboratory um, with a 16 camera Vicon system and, and uh, six force or seven force plates set up for both linear walking and for walking in circles and for turning corners. Uh, we have a few treadmills uh, in our laboratory. Um, in a separate lab, we've got a biplane fluoroscopy system, which is specialized in the foot and ankle, but it is flexible enough to look at the knee uh, or the residual limb of an amputee or, or will be in the future. Right now we're specializing in, in the foot and ankle. Um, we also have a Vicon system that's tied to the biplane system that allows us to do both uh, full body kinematics and foot kinematics at the same time. Uh, and then we also have a, a robotic gait simulator. So we can't use this with humans, but with cada cadaveric feet, we can take a cadaver foot and then uh, walk it through space by moving, uh, holding the foot still and moving the ground relative to the, to the um to the cadaver foot. And that allows us to study things that you can never study in a human. You could put in an arthroplasty and put it in well and then intentionally misalign it in the transverse plane or the frontal plane and see how that affects uh, distal bone foot kinematics. Um, you can fuse the ankle joint and look at how that affects the subtalar joint. Things we'd love to do in the future with our biplane system, we can actually do with cadavers now uh, with our gait simulator. Okay, I'm really jealous. <laughs> <laughs> When I hear about all that, um, in in our lab we have uh, we have two labs. We have an overground lab that has a Vicon system and and, and in ground force plates, and then we have an instrumented treadmill lab that has a Vicon system and as well as a, a, an instrumented treadmill. Um, so that allows us. And the model that we use, we we basically look at the calcaneus with respect to the tibia because I haven't been happy with the multi-segment foot models. And maybe it's just, I haven't worked with them enough, but um, I I'm keep hoping that the technology will allow us to get at that tail and navicular joint a little bit better. Um, so until then we look at the subtail, we look at the tibia with respect to the calcaneus and we interpret the frontal plane motion to be subtalar and the transverse plane motion to be more subtalar and the sagittal plane motion to be more, more um, tail and navicular. I'm sorry, um, ankle. Um, so, and that actually comes from Arnie Lundberg's work as well. So that's kind of how we interpret that data. And then we're very interested in, um, again, taking things outside. So we um, have uh, a lot of work is, is aimed at tibial accelerometry. It's interesting. We, we've published work to show that the, the tibial shock down at the ankle is highly correlated with the vertical load rate. So it gives you a, a surrogate measure, so to speak, of what the body's experiencing. But we sometimes find that someone may not have a very high load rate, but they have high tibial shock. And so you have to then think about the fact that these are really two different measures, even though that one is often used as a surrogate and they're correlated, um, the ground reaction force is a measure of all of the body, whereas tibial shock is, is the actual acceleration of the tibia at that point where you have your accelerometer. So it gives you maybe a better local measure of the impact that's that the foot and lower leg are experiencing. And, you know, my focus is on, is, is on running, uh, warning and walking, but the majority of running related injuries are from the knee down. So this gives us additional information about what's happening more locally than maybe something like um, vertical ground reaction forces. We, in my group, we do a lot of the same type of measurements. So we measure movement forces and EMG. So we have uh, motion capture systems, but we have a whole slew of other cameras that, other than uh, uh, Vicon system we use. In fact, uh, there's regular high-speed videography. Uh, we also cook up uh, measurement methods that are quite ad hoc, purely based on the nature of the question. I, and there I want to maybe emphasize what, what we've learned as, as pushing existing technologies to their limits and also more carefully characterizing what is uh, real variability in measurement versus what is sensor noise. Simple questions like where you attach a marker makes a huge difference. I don't have to tell, I think anyone here and some of the names I see in the attendees list probably know this way better than I do. Um, 
for, I'm here, I will refer to some very old literature from the 60s that uh, comes from NASA funded work and in NASA itself on things called lines of no extension. So if you think about your skin, as you move your joints, some parts of the skin stretch and other parts compress, which means there are some regions which don't stretch or compress. These are really special areas which are great for attaching a spacesuit onto you or to attach markers. We have we are yet to really do this very systematically in, in the foot. A lot of this has been done in arms and shoulders and upper body, but to, to even know where should we attach markers and revisit those questions which are considered standard practice may, may have value. Uh, I think there was a question on the, again, the Q&A that I saw about de de detecting impacts and calculating impact rates. The, a lot of the impact, like Irene said, is a, is a shock wave that's propagating from the ground close to the foot is really where your uh, things uh, hit very early on in, in stance, especially in running. And in that context, being able to precisely detect contact is not a very straightforward problem. We currently set thresholds on the force plate and say, hey, the load goes about this, we, there's been contact. But some of the early transients, you may not even measure with the force plate. So we, we uh, try to toy around with using collimated light sources and looking for uh, visible light gaps as a way of detecting contact. You can do a lot of these things in the lab, but now if you want to take things out onto the field, that's a whole different ballgame. And, and there's, there's always trade-offs of uh, measurement accuracy versus uh, realism of the uh, the the actual measurement you're making are you making it in an ecologically sensible setting uh, that that trade off i think there is no cut and dry answer we have and it's really really problem specific i'll just uh chime in uh, i don't think either madhu or irene mentioned uh planet pressure measurements that's another uh, tool in our arsenal um, we use this both with living subjects um, in shoe and then platform based we have um uh, Novell systems. And then we also are able to look at some um, planar pressure with our Caterbury gate cylinder. We mount that on top of the force plate and then look at how the various changes we're making to the cadaver feet um, affect the, the planar pressure beneath the, beneath the foot. So that's an important tool to have in your toolbox too. That's great. Is there any best practices that you could recommend for the technology you described? Obviously, you've all said you use a Bicon system. Is there any particular best practices you could recommend to the other researchers tending today. And I know, Irene, for yourself, you've done a lot with inertial uh, sensors, especially with the Boston Marathon. Do you have any best practices of how you go about like attaching those inertial sensors for that sort of run or kind of things you've learned that you could improve on like doing that research uh, again? Um, well, I can talk about the Boston Marathon. We learned a lot from that. Um, uh, one of the things that we learned is that one of the things in terms of attachment, we, we had people come to the um, where they pick up their numbers, the expo, and this is where we gave them the, um, the IMUs to use for the race. And we showed them how to attach it because we had done a pilot study. And I, I strongly suggest if you're going to do a large scale study, do a small pilot study because you learn a ton. Um, and we learned a lot from the pilot study in terms of people putting them on upside down and, you know, all kind of putting them on the wrong leg and putting them on the, wrong, on the outside versus the inside, et cetera. So we, we learned from that and we thought we're going to be really diligent. And we, we, you know, we marked the leg and we marked the device and, you know, we didn't have those problems, but we also marked the strap thinking we want them because the tightness is really important, right? We all know that you don't want to lose something that's sort of flapping around, but it's not, can't be so tight that it, you know, is uncomfortable. So we came up with the tightness and we marked the strap. Right. So now remember, we're in a, a temperature controlled environment when we did this. Well, these individuals put them on and tightened them to that line that we made on the strap. And it caused a lot of problems. People were uncomfortable. It caused some blistering. Some people took them off. So, um, again, I think uh, well, if we were to do that again, I would tell them snug, but not uncomfortable. Something like that. I think that's that's really important. Um, I think it's it's uh, in terms of the IMUs, if you're doing it in large scale, the other thing you have to remember is you 
really do need to try to get a sort of a standardized location as to where you're going to place them because the higher up you go, the more, the, the lower that tibial shock will be, right? Um, and in fact, you know, in running, let's say an average might be 10 Gs. By the time it hits your head, it's one to two Gs because you don't want to have a shaken adult syndrome and you need, your body's a big attenuator. So where you locate that, I think is, is very important. Um, so those are some lessons that we learned. Now, we also conducted a study in which we um, did an overwrap um, of the device versus a strap because the strap's the easiest way to put it on. The overwrap, um, we felt like maybe you will get a better secure attachment to the bone. I mean, one of, when I first started looking at tibial accelerometry a long time ago, um, very early in my career, I got in touch with Mario Lafortune um, and said, you know, how do I, how do I make sure I get good data? Well, he put them on a pin. Now, obviously you can't put it on a pin in the tibia of these patients. So he just said, make sure you're really tightly affixed. So I, I was really conscious of that. Our results suggested that um, variability was clearly less when you firmly attached it, but the mean values really weren't much different, which is actually kind of reassuring for us because it's hard to overwrap. You know, it's better if we can just sort of strap it on, make sure it's, it's snug and tight. So, you know, we're learning those kinds of, those are the kinds of studies that we're doing to try to optimize how we measure these things in the field. I would just, uh, as far as best practices go, one thing that we've struggled with is um, collecting, I'm embarrassed to say this, but collecting um, a bunch of data and not processing one subject soup to nuts and then doing that when you're halfway through your study and you realize, oh, there's a problem with this marker construct that I wish I had thought about two years ago and fixed, but now we're stuck with this. Um, so yeah, that's the best practice lesson that I've learned painfully uh, to really collect data up front, get really good pilot data and process it completely before you dive into the actual study itself. Don't be embarrassed. We've all made that mistake. No. It's, one, it's one of the like golden rules that I tell my students now because that, that I think we've all experienced that at some point. I, I, I would like to add one other thing that maybe we do as, I, I don't know whether to call it best practice, but we found value in doing it. What, what Bill said, I would like to repeat that, but other, other than that, a draw a free body diagram of what you're measuring. Know where, what are all the forces acting on your foot that you think are acting on your foot and where they're going to be. It, it's true for a cadaveric system. It's true for an in vivo experiment. If you're attaching external things to the foot and making measurements, not knowing the free body diagram, you could end up with not really measuring what you thought you're measuring. That That is really, really, uh, painful lesson we've learned on more than one occasion. Apparently we didn't learn it well the first few times. I think that brings up a really good point, Madhu. And in the, this is in the physical therapy world. We are really trying hard to bring biomechanics back into the classroom because it's starting to get sort of pushed out by all of these other things that, pe that the education programs think that they need. Um, and because biomechanics is a foundation for movement and as physical therapists, we are trained to evaluate movement, to change movement. And if we can't draw a free body diagram, you know, we can't tell the difference between doing a, a squat, you know, that's going to be more quad dominated or, or, or hip dominated, for example. Um, and there's so many people that cannot draw a simple free body diagram. Um, I, maybe not so much in biomechanics uh, curriculums, but certainly in the PT curriculums. And so I can't, I can't emphasize enough. I agree. I think that in the education world, we need to be able to, to do that. That's great. I think that really... Uh, kind of, of uh, follows on from the next question that I wanted to ask because we kind of already started this conversation about biomechanical models and recommendations and multi these so many different options uh, different biomechanical models that are available we've got like the Oxford foot model the Rosalini model I just wondered uh, if you've got any uh, take on what the benefits and challenges of all these different models and if there's any one in particular that you recommend or use within your lab we can I would like to go first with this if uh, Bill or you don't mind. It's it's close to close to our heart. We keep uh, thinking about models in my group um, quite a, a fair bit in many contexts and including the foot. Uh, to use an anecdote about my my PhD advisor who commented about the wrist, but I think that applies to the foot to some degree. It looks like a bag of marbles. 
it's a really complicated system. What are you going to do with it? You can build very complicated models that you can simulate. Uh, and to, to quote uh, another famous physicist, give me four parameters and I'll build you an elephant. Give me a fifth and I'll make, you, make it wag its trunk. You, five, the number of parameters you have in foot models is mind boggling. Many of those we can measure. And thanks to the kind of systems that Bill's talking about and so on, we have effective ways of constraining those models, but we are still far from saying that model represents reality. And I think the more we understand any single system, not just the foot, we're going to find that models are inadequate to do everything. But models may be great at doing one or two things. So having questions in mind that, that you apply and develop a model for, that, that I think is, is uh, what we've found to be useful. Don't look for the holy grail of models, but rather look for the model that answers and can clarify what's happening in that specific question that you're uh, interested in. And that can be a simple model like a sheet of paper, or it can be a more complicated model. But, uh, and physical models also play a role here. But by that, I mean building toys. And toys can be instructive uh, and, and make you realize, oh, I forgot about friction. And maybe a little bit of friction changes everything. And you realize that when you build a little physical toy and experiment with it in your lab. Uh, these, are, these are ways of building confidence in models for us. Yeah, that's a great point, Madhu. Um, I'll just uh, chime in. Uh, I, I won't rate the multi-segment foot models. Um, but just to, just to say that one thing that we're hoping to do with our biplane system is to instrument people with um, multi-segment foot models and collect data, data at the same time. And put uh, retro, you know, radioactive, um, retro, excuse me, put uh, tantalum beads in the kinematic markers. So we can actually use the biplane system to track the kinematic markers. We can, then we can use the Vicon system to track the kinematic markers and really understand the differences and. Is there error occurring in the motion analysis or is the error occurring because the marker is moving relative to the bone? Um, and we'll be able to have you know, a, a three different foot models at the same time that will allow us to answer those questions. It should also allow us to optimize where we put the markers on, on the foot. If there are certain areas, uh, as Matt had mentioned previously, that the skin does not buckle. Um, and there are other areas where it does buckle or it stretches or there are tendons that are moving. Um, and you can, you know, you can put 100 markers in the foot and see which markers are, are steady relative or fixed relative to the underlying bones. That's something that we'd like to explore uh, moving forward. 100 is a facetious number, but a lot of markers in the foot. I think that's really exciting work. Um, it kind of builds upon the work of Chris Nestor, where he didn't he do something similar where he put tantalum or he put pins into bones and he also put markers and then looked at compared the difference between the two. So I believe uh, Richard Jones is on the phone call uh, and he was uh, involved uh, in that study as well. Um, they put bone pins in themselves. There was a group of seven or eight people. They were the foot and ankle research team. <laughs> and uh, there's a nice acronym there. And they, uh, they instrumented themselves. And yeah, so that's the, that's the, I believe the best data out there as far as what, until biplane philosophy systems hit, hit the ground. Um, is the, the work that, that Chris and Richard did. Yeah, it's definitely a landmark. I think one of the other problems that we have to deal with with the foot um, is the fact that, you know, we aren't really barefoot most of the time, although, of course, I would love for us all to be more so, but um, we wear shoes and we know that shoes influence the, the motion of the foot. So if we do studies that are barefoot, we don't really know how that translates into the foot, which again is, an, and, and it's difficult to put markers and people have, have definitely attempted to do this by cutting holes in the shoe and hopefully not compromising the shoe too much um, so that they can look at the foot in the shoe. But again, this is another advantage of some of the fluoroscopy day, uh, techniques is that you can actually look at how the foot functions in the shoe itself. That's right. Or how, how orthotics affect the foot in the yeah. shoe. Exactly. That's great. That kind of leads on to the, we've kind of already talked about the challenges, but especially the fact that the foot is so small and there's so many bones in it. What are the challenges of using this technology in terms of even like manipulating the foot to ensure that you're getting the right marker placement, especially if you're not doing like in vivo capture is the, 
any best practices that you can recommend or anything that's worked for you uh, during data capture, especially with market data? Well, I can start. I mean, we don't, as I said, we aren't measuring the, the midfoot, the, the tail and navicular. We look at just the calcaneus and the tibia. And we do cut a hole in the back of a shoe. So that, because we do know there's been early data look, suggesting that the shoe does not move as the foot does. And in fact, the shoe moves more than the foot does. Um, and so it overestimates in general the, the, the motion. And so we actually put markers in the, in, on the calcaneus that project out. And actually we don't really need to project them out anymore. We used to because the systems weren't so good at identifying, but now we don't have to put little stems on them and we can just put them on the heel. Um, I mean, it has some challenges, but um, that's how, that's, that's what we do to try to be, get a more valid assessment of what's happening between the calcaneus and the tibia. That's great. Does anyone have anything else that they can add? I would just note that uh, you know we we have new people joining our laboratory, and it takes a little time to, to train people on how to put the markers on the foot. And um, you know you want to make sure that again lessons learned. We did a study where we forgot a key marker on the second metatarsal head, and no one caught it, and collected a bunch of data without it. You know, and so having some redundancy in your group, and and making sure you're careful when you're instrumenting. Uh, your foot markers um, is an important thing to consider. Would you, uh, go on, sorry, Madhu. No, for you first, Kim, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, Bill, uh, with that, would you now recommend maybe running like a practice, like run the model just on one trial during the data collection, just to kind of cap, uh, like stop those scenarios happening again? You know, at least then you know, oh, I've actually missed a marker placement. This model's not going to run and identify it during the capture. That's one possibility, or just also making sure that everyone involved in the data collection knows what to look for, and there's some redundancy in, in knowledge, and you're, you know, you're just you're using checklists to make sure that you've got everything you need to, to do. Yep. That's great, Madhu. Sorry, you can. Uh, I was going to simply mention that there are a few few others, uh, many others in the field who are who are doing quite exciting measurements, and I want to mention. At, since you you have connections to Liverpool, Kim, the, at the University of Liverpool, there's a pretty strong foot, foot biomechanics group, and I even see one of them in the audience, uh, Christian Daoud, is one of the attendees, and he, he and uh, his colleagues have done pr pretty amazing work on uh, measurement accuracy of these these sensors and foot models in particular. So, uh, and I I believe they also now do a biplanar fluoroscopy. I don't know how how exactly it is uh, specialized for the foot, but uh, they do they do have a X-ROM system already. That's great. Um, thank you for that. What I'm gonna do now uh, for the attendees, I'm gonna submit a poll to everyone. So um, feel free to answer that whilst we're answering the next question. Uh, so that'll pop up on your screen. So while I'm answering the next question, We've seen a rise in popularity of new technologies such as inertial sensors. Do you see any trends on the horizon for how technology will continue to evolve to better serve foot and ankle biomechanics? Portable sensors, I think, no? Weight-bearing CT scanners is an area that uh, uh, has made a difference. Yeah, and I, I would say the wearable sensors are, are really um, where we're in terms of understanding mechanics outside in natural environments. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy, it's not trivial to get three dimensional angles and anatomical reference frames with these devices. And so, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more work in that area um, as we go forward. We've started out looking at something very simple, which is just tibial acceleration, but um, I think that they have the potential. I mean, people are actually working now on, on, on um, generating ground reaction force curves from tibial acceleration data. And so that whole area of modeling using these the just wearable sensors is pretty exciting um, that we can get that kind of information through, through some of these deep learning techniques, et cetera. I, I would also emphasize the role, I think, in at least uh, not necessarily in large scale clinical studies, but in very pointed lab based scientific studies ad hoc constructed devices and sensors play a huge, it can also be in field studies, a, a study on foot calluses 
and sensing in the foot comes to mind. Some of that work was uh, with Dan Lieberman and, and Nicoloka, I believe, who looked at uh, how, how foot calluses develop in hab habitually barefoot populations. And they essentially rigged up a way of measuring foot sensitivity in the field and got uh, incredible quality data out of it. So sometimes uh, these ad hoc sensors, as opposed to a, a, a big uh, waiting for the development of a new technology can make a big difference. And that could in turn drive new technologies that others like myself would say buy and use. But yeah, I just want to piggyback on that, just to, again, to, to highlight that work. I think that work was really exciting. Um, and it, it was, um, I think it was surprising to some people because what they found, and correct me if I'm wrong, Madhu, but they found that the calluses actually don't filter out the information, the sensory information, which a lot of us think or thought, but they actually transmit it so that we, we it may even amplify it. I can't remember if that's the case, but certainly transmit those forces so that they are sensed. So that was really cool footwork, foot and ankle work. Right, yeah, exactly. Calluses don't appear to affect tactile sensitivity in the sole of the foot, which, yeah. which is quite remarkable. Mm. That's great. Um, next question. So we, it's been a tough year for all of us with the pandemic, um, in particular for research. Um, how has this impacted and, and changed the research that you're able to do within your lab? And is there been any new techniques that you've been able to adopt that you've found as a benefit that once the pandemic subsides that you'll be able to take going forward? I'm not sure this has been a, a benefit. Um... And this is a little trite, but I think our group now has gotten a lot better at communicating via video conferencing. Um, uh, just because we had to, you know, we can't meet in person. Um, but as far as from a research standpoint, uh, there hasn't been any positives that I can think of. I tried to think of this question earlier today. Um, it's everything is harder now. Um, we're limited to how many patients we can have per week in our building. Um, we wear extensive PPE when we interact with patients. Uh, it takes longer. We have staff who are concerned about being around patients. You know, it's just, it's a, it's a very difficult situation right now. And moving forward, uh, I'm not sure any of those things will, will benefit research in general. So sorry to be a little pessimistic there, but I, I don't have a positive answer to that, to that question. Yeah, we, we have had negative effects as well as probably everyone has. I mean, one of the, most of our studies have been able to go on, but we have a study in which we're looking at fatigue um, and we already started the study. And if you try to fatigue somebody with a mask on and they're running, it's a very different kind of fatigue. Um, and so, you know, we, we had to actually stop collecting data on that. We wanted to collect some more data. We had part of it done. Um, so that was sort of a negative effect as well. And I don't think it's really helped us in any other way, except the thing that I've noticed that has to do with the video conferencing as well, is that we're able to do something that we could have done before, we just didn't have the awareness of it. And that is to bring other people into the lab, so to speak. Um, they don't have to travel and they can give seminars. So we've been really relying more on that to get other people to help nurture our, our lab and our team through um, video seminars. I, I want to second Bill to some degree. There is, it's very hard to find um, major positives. Uh, I, of course, everyone talks about the general level, increased level of anxiety and how that's affected research. I, I, among other things, we, re, we need a clear head to think and uh, anxiety does not provoke a clear head. I would uh, double that by saying that it's, it is, you, you, it's a combination of also the, the, the extreme sorrow of seeing the damage that's, go, that's happening to people's lives all around. And that's very hard to ignore. There are certain i guess in some ways we are we are privileged that we are still able to do research to some degree i i feel pretty grateful about that so may, maybe a little better sense of our place and our uh, the the good fortune is something i will carry forward my lab is partly mathematical and uh, i should i should say that has been not particularly hindered because you sit and think but it that also faced impacts because one of the most effective ways of uh, thinking in a collaborative project is one big blackboard or a whiteboard and you stand around it. There are virtual alternatives. They don't quite cut it compared to having a physical pen and a, and a whiteboard to plan ideas. 
or design experiments or pl plan models. Um, the one positive directly in terms of actual research has been it's forced us to think a little bit more theoretically, which means that we think through the problem a little further and deeper before we dive into the experiments. I don't know if that's, time will tell whether that is manifested in the form of uh, lesser, less error prone experiments, but it feels like we've thought a little more about the problem before we go into the lab and make a measurement because it's now one person or two people at a time in the lab and you can't, you can't keep getting more and more subjects like Irene and Bill mentioned, there are limits to numbers. So maybe we will carry forward the, the tendency to spend a little bit more time thinking, planning, uh, using our theoretical half of our head to, to guide the experiments a little more. Yeah, Does, do you think this will end up allowing more researchers, more collaboration in terms of the willingness to like share data? So given that the pandemic, especially it's worldwide and every country is affected differently. So some people are not even at the stage that they're able to go in the lab. Do you think there'll be more of an opportunity to have more of that shared data? I, I have very strong views of this and I will say it we should have been sharing data all the time. It is incredible that we don't, that we publish work without sharing the data where uh, reproducibility of the work is, is paramount. Um, if the pandemic is increasing willingness to share data, I would uh, cheer that on. Uh, but I, this, this should also partly, and is in fact already coming partly from journals, which now may have made many journals that have made it a requirement that you share the data that went into creating that figure. That, that fi every figure must be reproducible by a reader. And I'm, I'm all in support of that. I am too. I just wish it was easier. Um, <laughs> that, we've, we've run into you know, issues with our, our IRB. You know, we have some old CT scans that I've been asked to share and I love to share. And because a person 20 years ago didn't have the, we didn't have the right IRB application, didn't have the right, um, consent form. I can't share it with other researchers. And I just find that incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Um, and also, I wish it was just easier. I wish there were, uh, I, I recently explored a, a site at my university to, to share data. And I, um, I wish it was just easier to do. Yeah, but I'm all for it. I would agree with that. We, you know, the data use agreements can be complicated depending on what type of research, what, what are they going to use it for? It, it does get complicated. It was so much easier back in the day. You could just share your data and it wasn't, you know, um, things have just, regulations and rules have become much stricter and it has made it more difficult. I would agree. Yep. That's great. Do you have any advice or recommendations for the students and junior researchers here today in terms of, um, that are interested in foot and ankle biomechanics. So uh, I can go first there. Um, I would recommend finding a really um, committed and interested clinical collaborator as soon as possible and trying to sit them down and, and pick their brain and ask as many questions as you can and try and understand the kind of problems that they see in their, in their clinical practice that they just don't have time to, to address. And if you get lucky, you'll be able to find some areas that you're interested in too that overlap with your clinical collaborators' interests and then go from there. Um, I'll go next. So I think it's important for young scientists to seek out the right mentors as well um, that uh, are, are going to be doing work in the area of their interest um, and I think that that's really paramount because, you know, when you're doing, especially when you're talking about your PhD and even postdoc, because those are the, those are the springboards to your career. So finding the right person, I think is really important. And it's not just the topic, uh, and this is probably a little off topic, but it's also, do you get along with them? You know, can, do you, do you, do, is this somebody that can be part of your family for at least another four or five years? Um, that's also important. So, yeah. Is there anything you can add on, Madhu? Uh, I mean, I, I wish I had the, the advice from Bill and Irene uh, long ago. They are <laughs> fantastic points. I wish I had uh, that advice too. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the only thing I would say is the foot is cool. I did not think so long ago, but I now do think so. And it's full of 
really, really many open questions that I don't think any of us have really thought of even or imagined yet. So there's there's very little reason to stick to precedence in the literature. Dive in and you're going to find something new about how the foot works. It definitely yeah. is a wide open area for research, I would agree. Yeah, me too. I was preparing for this talk and I was thinking about how 20 years ago I gave a talk and I said the foot and ankle is a wide open area and it's still wide open. Yeah. That's great. Um, my final question before I open it up to the audience, how can our listeners of this webinar and also when it goes as a podcast, reach out uh, to you if they would like to follow up with anything they've heard here today? Uh, via email is the best way for me. I'm not sure how best to get that email out there, but... Um... I think if we add it to the, the chat um, and that goes out to everyone, so then anyone, if everyone's happy to do that, if they're happy to share their email um, or social media, and we can go from there. Um, my, my name is not particularly unique, but it, there's very few uh, with the combination of my first and last name and biomechanics. I think there's only one other person that I can find on Google. Uh, that will lead you to my email and so on quite easily. I have one with the same name, but he's a dentist and he stopped, stopped doing research in the 90s. So there's no overlap there. We, we are also gonna do a follow up email from this uh, webinar. So that will also include your email addresses as well there. So I have one question from the audience, which I'm gonna start. Um, have you, um, Bill, you talked about the uh, pressure measurement, but have you combined that also with the kinematics uh, whilst doing your research? Uh, it's an ongoing question. Uh, we're very interested in how um, foot shape uh, relates to plantar pressure and can you predict plantar pressure based on foot shape, both statically and dynamically? Um, so it's an ongoing area of research uh, in our group. That's great. The next question, what importance do you give to hip, knee, ankle joint amplitudes and plantar pressure analysis in your research? If anyone can answer that question. We, we are not, um, we're not looking at plantar pressure. We just don't have that technology. Um, but I think that the foot bone's connected to the hip bone. And if you're gonna try to understand the foot, you have to understand what's happening more proximally at the knee and the hip. So it's important. I think it's a very good question that we are addressing those joints as well, if you're interested in foot pathology or, or mechanics. Yeah, I agree. Nothing to add, but uh, yeah, as I mean, so they're all connected. Um, this question is for uh, Irene. Uh, Professor Davis mentioned we need to go outside. I have a quick question about the feedback modality in running retraining. Feedback on tibial, uh, tibial shock has been given visually and in a haptic manner in biomechanics lab and more recently auditory out of the lab. Would one be better than the other for applications in the wild? So that's a really good question. And, and if uh, this is another wide open area in terms of um, uh, gait in general and certainly foot mechanics in terms of feedback, um, we don't really know what the optimal feedback is, what the optimal paradigm, like how, how often do you give it? How do you give it? I mean, we've come up with one, but there's, there's probably lots of ways to do it. Um, I know that, I believe that Roy Chung had done a study looking at um, auditory versus visual. And I think auditory was uh, improved over uh, visual just because it's less to process. Um, so I'm not sure what is ideal. My, my thoughts about haptic, and this is really just anecdotal. I, I wonder, haptic would have to really be changed I think it, it would have to be variable because you know when you start to feel something after a while, you, you kind of tune it out. Um, and so I just, I wonder about that. I think that that's an, it's certainly a very um, wide open area. And I think that haptic is a very convenient way to give feedback because you don't have to have a sound. It's not distracting to anyone else. Um, so there, there are lots of reasons for haptic being really good, but I don't have a lot of experience in that area. I know that people like Tor Bezier has to have done work in that area and probably um, we need more research to understand which one's ideal. Kim, can I ask a follow-up question to Irene? That's uh, yeah, I, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious. So haptic, I I and I see what you mean by people tune it out. You don't you don't pay attention to it anymore. Is co cognitive attention 
correlated with our response in in any of in these contexts at least is there a literature on it so are you asking about um do people are, are they just like can they do this under distraction is that what you're no, asking uh, no 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 i'm you're... saying the haptic feedback we may not be uh, yeah. con very consciously perceiving it yeah. but could it still continue to alter how we step uh, good. I, I think it could. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not doubting that it can. I think. I, I just. I, I would be interested to know whether people do sort of phase, kind of tune it out because you know it's like kind of we put a watch on for the first time. You feel it. You're you're cognizant of it, and then you sort of ignore it. You don't even feel it anymore. It just becomes. Um, you know, people ask the question about sound, like, does it become irritating? And it can become irritating. So mm -hmm. how often do you give the feedback? Do you give it in a bandwidth where as long as they're in the right bandwidth, you know, it's called bandwidth feedback, you don't give them a sound. You don't give them a sound with every single foot strike, but you give them a sound if they're outside this bandwidth. But I mean, this is why I say, I think that this area is for people who are looking at getting into the field, this is a wide open area for understanding how we optimize it. I think it's powerful. I think real-time feedback is very powerful. And it's the way that we change movement patterns. I think we just don't know what the best way to do that is at this time. That's great. Um, there's just a couple uh, questions left in the chat, which I'll ask you, and then I'm mindful of the time and everything. Um, did you manage to combine motion analysis and patient-specific finding, finding element modeling without going through ideal joints? So I think that might be for me. Um, we, uh, the answer is no. Um, we, um, well, sorry, it's complicated. We, we did uh, two finite element models and it was a ton of man hours to get the models up and running. Um, we did uh, one healthy subject and one diabetic subject. And we were trying to explore the internal stresses and how they differed with the diabetic patient and the, or the diabetic subject and the healthy subject. And um, the model that we did was not ready for prime time. So it was patient specific, but you would never do this in a real patient because you, you can't afford to spend five months making the model. Uh, that's, the, that's the answer to the question. That's great. Um, I think this question's for you, Irene. Um, you briefly mentioned the role of footwear on foot and ankle bound mechanics. What are the next advances in these areas? Um, I think it depends on who you ask. I think if you ask Nike, they would give you a very different response than you ask some, you know, perhaps me. Um, I think that uh, there's certainly a push to try to enhance performance um, with footwear. And, you know, most of my research has been focused on injury. So I think that that's certainly important. Um, performance is important and important to a lot of people. Um, if you're interested in foot health, I think that the objectives may be very different. Um, and so I think that, that, that we need to understand how footwear affects mechanics and long-term how footwear affects the musculoskeletal health of the, 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 the foot. Um, and there are, there are a number of cross-sectional studies right now that look at people who grew up barefoot or people who grew up in shoes, but there's not a lot of prospective studies on footwear and sort of musculoskeletal health. So we need, we really need those. They're hard to do. Um, they're hard to get funded. I can tell you that from, from experience. Um, so, but I think it's what we really need. So, you know, I would love to have, you know, some footwear companies, uh, Annie up, uh, here's my, my, my plea, um, to try to understand a little bit more about how footwear does influence our musculoskeletal health. That's great. Uh, last two quick questions. Uh, Bill, you've got a question. Are you on Twitter, uh, by the audience? What? I am not, sorry. Uh, and then the final one is for you, Irene. Um, do you deal much with gait retraining for running and do you get good results? <laughs> um, yeah, we have a whole center uh, focused on gait retraining. Um, and we, we, we believe we have good results. Um, yeah, I don't believe that everybody needs their gait retrained. Uh, we typically see runners who have been through three courses on average of physical therapy, and they've, they've addressed what I'm going to call the hardware, their musculoskeletal system. They've gotten stronger. They've tried stopping and then, um, and then training, uh, increasing progressively their, their training. So they've tried the, you know, in, uh, controlling the dosage and the training load. And those are the people when they come to us who have not had success that we think probably it maybe is their mechanics. 
And so we will uh, investigate that and look at that. Um, we do see very good results. Uh, that's anecdotal, but we also now are um, collecting data pre, post, one, six, and 12 months out. And we do uh, validated functional outcome scores on those individuals so that we can actually monitor the success of the program. Because I think a lot of physical therapists think that they're successful. And I think we overestimate our success because we don't bring people back. And if someone isn't having success, they're not likely to come back to you and say, I'm not, I'm not happy. They're likely to go to someone else. So I think it's really important for us if we really want to say with confidence that our program is successful is that they monitor it in a, in, in a very systematic way. That's great. There's just one more question that's just come in at the last, uh, so this is the last question I'm gonna ask you all. Would you agree uh, that, oh, it's all of a sudden disappeared on me? That may be my fault. I, I did not realize typing an answer makes it uh, disappear. I think okay, I, I, I found it, answer. it's okay. Um, would you agree that publishing data processing methodology is as critical as sharing the data? Should, for example, all code be published to allow verification of the process? I say a good strong yes in general. Uh, sometimes code that you write, we write in in house can be poorly documented and even more opaque than describing the methods of what we did. I think right describing the methods is a great idea, and in parallel, whenever possible, to share the code uh, because sometimes we just make tacit assumptions when we write the methods, but you can't make tacit assumptions in code. So at least those assumptions in underlying your analysis are quite transparent that way, if need be. I agree. I'm just leery of uh, posting, posting code and then having it be a source of questions that you have to then spend time trying to answer. That's great. Yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say, I agree. It's one of those ideas that sounds really good on paper until you try to execute it. Yep. It, could, it could be challenging. Yeah. Well, that was all the questions. So thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over back to Amy now. Yep, wanted to come in quickly to thank Kim for doing such an excellent job of moderating and keeping the conversation flowing. But most of all, uh, to our panelists, thank you so much. Uh, Irene, Madhu, Bill, thank you so much for giving your time. We know that you're very busy, uh, but we really, really enjoyed the conversation. It was great to hear the back and forth. It was great to get everybody excited about some of the presentations that are coming up at the foot and ankle. Uh, biomechanics conference that's going to be in, in April. So just wanted to remind, remind everybody that this uh, has been recorded. So we will send everybody who registered for the webinar a copy of the recording. And in that, we will answer some of the questions that came up, such as how do you uh, find more information about the foot and ankle biomechanics conference? How do you find the webpage? How do you register? We'll be sure to put all of that information in there as well. And uh, one shameless plug, we will have one presentation from BICON from our technical support engineers talking about how to uh, use some of the models that were discussed today, such as Oxford Foot and Rizzoli, CGM2 inside of our Vicon system, and how to do some custom modeling as well. So hopefully that'll be interesting to everybody attending. But again, thank you so much uh, for all of the time for both the presenters and the attendees. I hope uh, you all enjoyed the conversation and we look forward to seeing you all at the upcoming Foot and Ankle Biomechanics Conference. Thank you for hosting this. Thank you. Amy. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Bye, Madhu. Bye, Irene. Bye-bye.